Hi, this is Laura, and I'm going to go through the answers to this Wireshark Packet Challenge. Look it up in the dictionary. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new profile that I will use just for this answer set. So I'm going to go to the bottom right hand corner, right mouse click, and choose new. And I'm going to call this uh, Packet Challenge. Oops, let's go to lowercase here. Uh, packet Challenge. I know I can type this in. Well, maybe not. Look it up in the dictionary. I'll click OK. All right, so now all the changes I make will be in this particular um, profile, and I won't be affecting any of my other profiles with things I may not want to keep. First thing, of course, I'm going to go to a larger font so we can all see what I'm doing here. Let me go one larger and resize these. All right, so let's see. Uh, question number one, what is the IP address of the client? And let me just jump to the top here. Well, we can look and we can see in frame number one right away, we have a DNS query going out here. Uh, we also see in frame number three, there is a SYN packet going out. So it appears that the client's IP address is 192.168.0.101. Question number two should be pretty simple. What is the IP address of the DNS server? Well, we can see that by frame number one, the client is sending a packet to 192.168.0.1. It is a DNS query, but to be exact, let's look at the host that is actually sending DNS responses. It is 192.168.0.1. Question number three, was the traffic captured closer to the client or closer to the www.dictionary.com server? Well, if we take a look in here, the DNS response that came back came back, indicating that the www.dictionary.com uh, host is located at 151.101.190.133. So frame number three is a SYN going out to that server. So let's just look at that conversation between the client and that server. I'm going to right mouse click on frame number three, and I'm going to do a conversation filter based on TCP. So we just have that simple conversation. Now the question is, is this capture taken closer to the client or closer to the server? I'm going to go to View, Time Display Format, and set this up for seconds since previous displayed packet. And that way I can see the time from the end of one frame to the next frame. It looks like the time from the SYN to the SYNAC here is about ten, a little over 10 milliseconds, almost 11 milliseconds. And then look how fast the time is between the SYNAC and the ACK. That's an indication that we're capturing closer to the client because we have the SYNAC coming in and the ACK going out almost immediately uh, than we are to the server. So we are sitting closer to the client in this case. We'll clear this out. Question number four, what browser did the client use? Well, we can go into this get request right here and frame number 10 and we can look inside the HTTP section of the frame. Let me collapse the IP in the TCP section. There we're looking for the user agent line and it tells us Firefox right here. Be careful of these because some of the browsers out there will say that they are all types of browsers. So if you look at Safari, Safari will say I am Firefox and I am uh, Internet Explorer and I am this and I, you know and that's an indication that something is Safari, is when it says it's absolutely everything. So this client is using Firefox. Uh, question number five, what is the purpose of the 301 moved permanently packet? Well, we need to find that packet in this one. It's really easy. If you had a larger trace file and you needed to go and find this 301 packet, one of the things you could do is in the HTTP portion of the packet, you could apply a filter for the status code value. So if I simply apply this filter, only one packet comes up. So frame number 12 is the one that holds our moved permanently. And we can see that, well, let me get rid of my filter. There we go. This client, uh, this is the get request that went out to the um dictionary.com and then we get the moved permanently and inside the moved 
permanently, we can see that this is a redirection to a secure connection. And I have another blog entry about that. If you go back to the September 2019 blogs, you'll see that I did an analysis of being redirected to a secure uh, connection to a target using a 301 moved permanently. Question number six, what cipher suite is used in this trace file? Now I'm using Wireshark version 3. Point, oh goodness, let's take a look. I am on 3.0.5. Now when Wireshark went to version 3, we could start using our TLS filter. So I can now put in a display filter just for TLS so I can pull up that traffic. We also can still say SSL as a filter, but you'll see that it gives you a yellow background now because that's going to go away at some point. So I'm going to use TLS as my filter. Now in here we can see that the client sends out a client hello and in that client hello, that client will provide a list of Cypher suites to the server. So these are all of the Cypher suites being offered to the server. In the server hello packets, that's where the selected Cypher suite will appear. And here we can see there's the Cypher suite that the server selected. Now, since there are more, there may be more than one secure connection in this trace file, I'm going to right mouse click on this Cypher suite line and I'm going to apply this as a column. And then I'm simply going to sort this column and jump to the top of the list here. So we can see that there are, there's more than one TLS connection here in the trace file, but in each case, the server selected the same Cypher suite. Question number seven, which TCP conversation stream index number had the highest initial round trip time? Let me get rid of my filter and sort again. Now we can, f uh, let me get rid of that Cypher suite column. I'm just going to remove it. I don't need it permanently in here. We can find the initial round trip time in any TCP packet except for the SYN packet. This information has not been calculated yet, but you can find the initial round trip time in a SYNAC packet or any other packets after that. Selecting frame number five, I'm going to expand the TCP section in this frame. And we're looking in the sequence and acknowledgement analysis section inside the TCP header. It's got the square brackets around it, which indicates that this is a Wireshark interpretation. Wireshark measures the initial round trip time for you. Anytime I ask you what is the largest value or the smallest value or the highest value or the lowest value, you're probably going to add that field as a column and then sort that column. That's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to right mouse click on the initial round trip time field right here and choose to apply this as a column. And then I'm just simply going to sort that column and I will jump to the top of the sort list. So the highest initial round trip time was seen right here. It is 0.33328. And if I want to know what stream index number that is, I can look higher in the TCP header and I can see this is stream index six. Now I usually have a column for my stream index numbers. So I'm going to right mouse click on stream index and choose apply as column. Now you may notice that when you apply that as a column, when you look at your DNS traffic, let me just sort by the original order here and go to the top. You'll notice that your DNS traffic does not have a stream index value because right now I'm just looking at TCP stream index values. I'm going to change that column so it also looks at UDP stream index values. I'll right mouse click on the stream index column and choose edit column. Up in the fields section, I'm going to put in pipe pipe udp.stream. And now that column will show me the value for the TCP stream index or the UDP stream index, whichever one matches the packet for that column. I'll say OK and I'll line it center so it looks a little better there. So our highest initial round trip time was seen in TCP stream number six. 
Question number eight. What canonical name, or C name, is associated with the server communicating in TCP Stream 1? Okay, let's just go ahead and sort again and jump to the top. The first TCP stream or conversation will be given stream number zero and the second one will be given stream number one. Here we can see there's stream number one. We can see the target the server's IP address is 151.101.190.133. If we want to know what canonical name is associated with that IP address we need to find out where the DNS um, response is that contains that information. So in this trace file it's pretty simple because if we just look up a little bit further into our DNS information we can see there's a response. We, we can see the, let's see, um, blah, 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 server number one, uh, stream number one, I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right one. Um, so stream number one, the server is 151.101.190.133 and right here we can see there is a standard query response saying that dictionary.map.fastly.net is at this address. But if we look up above this, there you will see the canonical name entry all spelled out. So the name is www.dictionary.com, that's what the user types in, but the actual name is dictionary.fastly.map.fastly.net you could look specifically for that value or specifically for canonical name responses. We can build a filter saying just show us the canonical name uh, DNS responses or the DNS responses that contain a canonical name. There you go. So I'm only looking at DNS responses that contain canonical names and we could even go a little bit farther uh, by putting in the IP address value that we are interested in. So I'm going to right mouse click on this value in this packet and just say apply a filter dot 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 and selected. So I'm looking for a DNS response that has a canonical name value and has this IP address in it. And here's where you will notice that there are other streams that also, other TCP streams, other TCP conversations that use canonical names in them. So when somebody goes to irene.dictionary.com it also resolves to the same canonical name at that address and www.thesaurus.com also resolves to that address. Question number nine. Towards which host can the larger TCP data segments travel. So we are interested in the maximum segment size value that is advertised by each host. So we are, we want to look at any packets that have the SIN bit on so we can get this information very easily. I'm going to go to frame number three which has the SIN bit on. It's just easy. I can right mouse click on the SIN bit and just say that I want to apply this as a filter. Let me get rid of my initial round trip time. And now what I'm looking at is I'm looking at all the SYN and the SYNAC packets going back and forth between the client and the different servers that to, uh, the server that it's communicating with. These are all different connections and we can see that it's between the same two hosts. When we look at the client's SYN packet here we can see that the client consistently advertises a maximum segment size of 1460 bytes. Let me just sort on the source column so everything kind of goes together here. There we go. So all these top packets are SYN packets from the client and in every one of the SYN packets that client advertises a maximum segment size of 1460 bytes. The server on the other hand advertises a maximum segment size of 1360. The server accepts smaller TCP segment sizes than the client. The larger TCP segment sizes will be able to flow towards the client but not to the, towards the server. Again, you could add one of these as a column. You could put maximum segment size as a column if you wish. So I'm going to go to the maximum segment size TCP option, go to the MSS value field, right mouse click and apply this as a column. And now I'm going to align this left. We can see 
the maximum segment size values of 1360 being advertised by the server. Question number 10. In how many frames does the word undertow appear? All right, well, let's just do a simple filter for this, a really lazy one. And you could see that I typed it in before. Contain, ah, contains, quote, under tow, under tow, goodness. Okay, so I just typed it in as frame, space, contains, space, and then in quotes, under tow. And the problem with this is that it's case sensitive. So if the word undertow is out there and it has a capital U or the whole thing's in capital letters, I wouldn't be able to detect those with this particular filter. Instead, I'm going to change this to matches instead of contains. I'm going to put in matches because when we use matches in Wireshark, by default now, Wireshark will put whatever follows that, whatever ASCII text is after that, it will look for that value in upper or lower case. So let's apply that. And here we can see that we see three different frames in which the word undertow appears. And let's just see where it appears. Let's look at these. Ah, we can see, so it looks like we have HTTP responses in which this appears. Now. I have TCP segment reassembly on here. These are actually three HTTP response packets. They don't appear that way because I have TCP reassembly on. In fact, I need to do a blog just focusing on this TCP reassembly feature. To turn reassembly off and actually see these as TCP response packets, I'm going to right mouse click inside of a TCP header and choose protocol preferences and turn off allow sub dissector to reassemble TCP streams. Now we can see sure enough it shows up saying that this is a response packet and after the TCP header I will see the HTTP dissector showing up. Now I was looking for that word undertow and here it is right there X powered by undertow. All right, I hope you had a good time with this packet challenge. I will be putting out some more packet challenges as we move closer to the release date of the Wireshark Workbook. The Wireshark Workbook is a book that is filled with just packet challenges and their answers, providing you with, you with a lot of practice on using Wireshark to find that needle in a haystack.